for anyone watching, of course. Now, today, uh, we actually have Michael Lynch on to talk about a subject that I think doesn't get the attention that it deserves, uh, like with many other things. Now, of course, for those who are already watching, uh, the subject is going to be on specifically John Davenant and then more broadly on hypothetical universalism as well, right? And so, yeah, uh, just introduce yourself, what you do, uh, just talk about who you are, really. Uh, yeah, I, uh, my name is Michael Lynch, as you said. Um, I teach in Delaware at a school, a classical school, Delaware Valley Classical School. I teach upper school humanities and uh, classic languages uh, like uh, Greek and Latin. Um, I am a member in an OPC church in the area. So I go to an Orthodox Presbyterian church and yeah, I don't know if you want to know anything else, but that's, that's kind of who I am and what I do. Right. Right. And, uh, where exactly could you talk about your history? Like, um, which, where you went to seminary? Yeah. Uh, things like yeah. that. Yeah. So I did my undergraduate uh, degree at the Moody Bible Institute in historical theology. Then I, uh, I went to Reform Theological Seminary in Jackson, where I did my Master's of Divinity. Um, and then I did my PhD at Calvin Seminary, um, where I did my dissertation on Davenant. Right. And uh, actually, I was interested to find out, uh, do you recall of anyone by the name of uh, Jeff Gleason? Yeah, I know Jeff. Yep. Yeah. School with him. Yeah, that's interesting because I, yeah, I was actually talking with him because uh, I go to his church, and I mentioned to him that I would be doing this at some point, point. and he was like, "Yeah, I had a class uh, with Lynch." I was like, "How do you know Lynch?" Uh, <laughs> that was interesting. It's quite a small world, uh, but yeah, Gleason, um, at some point, might be my pastor. I'm interested in, of course, uh, becoming a member soon. Oh yeah, Jeff is a great guy. Um, but yeah, uh, getting into like the actual subject. So I, I didn't have the best experience, I will say, uh, when I first came across Davin and his position. I was a bit younger. Uh, it was about maybe three years ago when I first heard about it. I was a little hostile to it, I will say, in the beginning. Um, I guess as many people are when they first hear about it. And nonetheless, uh, what was your experience like first coming across Davenant and his position uh how did you receive it yeah so I started I had heard of like Amy Roldianism and these sorts of things and four-point Calvinism all the way back mm -hmm. in my undergraduate time at the Moody Bible Institute indeed I had teachers that uh we're trying to argue something like that. I had a lot of Calvinist teachers and some of them were kind of four point Calvinist. They had some sort of uh, discomfort with the L and Tulip as they understood it. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'd heard about it for a while. I was kind of by default Owenian. Um, I, I had, uh, read some Owen and I read other people arguing for limited atonement and it it it, it seemed fine to me. Uh, I, by limited atonement, I really do mean like the Owen sort of variety, right? right. So I'm, I'm 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 when I use that term, I I mean that, right? So like what Owen teaches in the Death of Death, for example. Mm -hmm. Um. So it wasn't until at RTS where. Um, I met some folk, including the librarian there at the time, who kind of introduced me to data that um, was just not fitting kind of the, the picture of reform theology that I had had. Now, yeah. this was this was at the same time that I was reading Muller, uh, and I had been reading Muller because I as I as I said, even in my undergraduate studies, I had, was familiar with 
uh, Mueller's post-reformation were for dogmatics and red. And I, I kind of knew about this diversity, but then diversity on the extent of the atonement wasn't something that was kind of on my radar. But Mueller, just as I was in seminary, was publishing. He was just starting to lecture and publish on the diversity of the reform tradition on the extent of the atonement. And so that was kind of at the same time I was getting into some of this stuff and kind of researching it on my own and then realizing that that I've been told that there's kind of this one position that kind of everyone held to, but then I was reading guys uh, that were saying things that weren't fitting into that box very well. Mm -hmm. Not not just Davenant, but like some of the earlier guys like Musculus, Bollinger, Calvin, and these sorts of things. And, and I knew about the Calvin versus the Calvinist stuff on you know, is Calvin, you know, a four pointer, blah, 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 blah. I'd heard all that stuff, but, but I, I just realized that what Owen was saying, what I was reading in Owen, what I was reading Calvin saying, they were speaking such a different language when it came to the question of for whom did Christ die, even exegetically, like, uh, where Calvin's comfortable, um, talking about, uh, uh like on John three sixteen. The, uh, interpreting the world as being actually all people, whereas Owen is kind of forced to interpret all those texts as being Jew, Gentile, and only the elect. I, I was just seeing things that I, I, I just realized that th this was a lot messier. Then I started thinking to myself, ooh, this is, this is, this is dissertation material, right? There's like so <laughs> much here that and so few people like deal with this topic in any sort of um, very particular, very precise, um, careful sort of way that I, I just knew that there was a lot there. And then I read Davenant and I was absolutely um, blown away not so much because I was in agreement with it, but mm -hmm. because of so much of what he was saying was just not something I would have expected someone like him to be saying. And then also he starts out the first chapter of his, uh, uh, of his book on the death of Christ is a history of the controversy where he lays out his interpretation of, kind of like the histor history of the controversy on this topic and yeah. i was just i was just shocked by like some of the things that he was quoting and saying and so that's how i i and then i realized i i can't believe any no one's written a dissertation on davenant so i uh i when i applied to calvin i uh basically was like i want to study under Mueller and i want to do it under da uh, on davenant so that's it yeah. And I think that is, um, you know, like you said, even if one doesn't exactly want to embrace his position, uh, I think it's still interesting to reflect on it as being one of those examples that kind of exemplifies this problem where you kind of have this modern Calvinism. And it's not all modern, but what's modern is uh, like overly simplifying certain issues, not recognizing any sort of diversity on certain matters and i just think that this example kind of you know it shows how how many people don't actually understand the tradition all that well they kind of have this modern understanding of it uh but yeah now in the beginning of the work uh you mentioned like right at the beginning i think uh you mentioned that there were a lot of people who showed high praise for davenant Right. You have uh, people, you have conformists and nonconformists. Uh, you even have, I believe, uh, Aerosmith, uh, Westminster Divine, referring to him as the Augustine of his day. Right. So since Davenant is seen with such high praise, who exactly is Davenant? Yeah, uh, Davenant was uh, born in 1572. Um, in London, if I'm not mistaken, he uh, went to Cambridge. Then he was 
because of his proficiency uh, at Cambridge and his ability as a student. He was then offered a professor professorship there. He became the Lady Margaret Professor of Theology at Cambridge, which is the same uh, position that Erasmus was given in his brief time at Cambridge, uh, which is just suggestive of kind of that that uh, that post and its uh, prestigiousness. Mm -hmm. um, and then he went off to door. He was asked by King James to be one of the delegates to the Senate of Dort. He was one of those guys. Um, indeed, he's kind of, he's the one theologian that is picked. Uh, the rest of them, one is a bishop, one is Ward, who at the time isn't a professor, and a few others. But he, he's the he's the theologian, right, that uh, King James picks and um, out of the group. Anyways, uh, he goes off, does that. He comes back, and shortly thereafter, he's offered um, the bishopric uh, in Salisbury. And he takes that. And that's what he does until his death in 1641. So he's the Bishop of Salisbury until 1641. Mm -hmm. And so since the topic is on like his position of what we could call the atonement or Christ satisfaction, right? Now, of course, many people might not be familiar with like what hypothetical universalism even means because the latter part of that uh, has somewhat of a bad connotation. So, uh, and I actually enjoyed how you quote uh, David Piraeus, who says that uh, to play with equivocations is not befitting of theologians, but of sophists. Mm. So our definitions definitely matter in these conversations. So what, what exactly is uh, hypothetical universalism? Yeah, at the outset, I think it's important to realize that the term is, the term arises in another context. It arises in the French Emiraldian controversies, which largely happen at, near the end of Davenant's life and then afterwards. Indeed, the term hypothetical universalism is a term that he would have had no idea what was being discussed. I, I mean... Uh, he he would he, he, he that that is not a term he's familiar with uh, in English nor in any other la like in Latin. Um, it, it, it was a French term. It seemed to come from French actually. Um, um, so in the mo in modern uh, discussions of hypothetical universalism, like in scholarship, most people define hypothetical universalism to be something like the teaching that Christ died for all people in such a way that if all people believed, all people could be saved on account of that universal dying for all men. Um, and that's why it's hypothetical. Uh, and mm -hmm. that's why it's, there's a universalistic aspect. It's he died for all such that if all believed, all could be saved. Um I mean, Davenant really doesn't even, I mean, he kind of talks that way, um, but that's, um, it's a very scholarly sort of a, uh, historical or scholarly jargon way of talking. And uh, Davenant talks in different sorts of ways generally than that. But, but he, he agree, he, I think he would agree with the proposition that, you know, the way that we put it, you know, I think that he would agree that he agrees with that claim. So. Yeah. And with that in mind, uh, like you mentioned, like the, the term or the phrase itself is not something used in the early modern literature itself. Uh, but you know that there, there are two ways that the position that we're referring to is uh, represented. I believe it's uh, universal redemption and then the middle way or the via media. So I think that people, when they hear that, would assume that's, by via media, we mean that Davenant's view is a via media between Reformed theology and Remonstrant mm. theology. Now, is that the case, or is no, it different? No, no, no. Yeah, so when, well, uh, Davenant actually doesn't talk about a via media. Um, as far as I can remember, he doesn't talk about a middle way, even though he positions 
himself as a middle way between two positions. So he does that. It just, he never uses the phrase. Bishop Usher in his letters does talk about a middle way. He explicitly calls himself a middle way. And he positions himself exactly where Davenant does among hmm. two positions. The one position is the, what was called the contra remonstrant position uh, that you find at like uh, uh, previous to Dort and then at Dort. These are the anti arminians particularly in, in the Dutch community. Um, and now, even there, we have to be careful because Davenant is definitely contra remonstrant. He does yeah. not like, he, he despises Arminianism, really. There's no other way to put it. He never speaks positively of Arminianism. And he, he takes every opportunity to go after it. But um, there were certain anti-Arminians that Davenant and Usher are positioning themselves against. And then the other side is Arminianism. So it's it's better. It, so the way that I would put it is not it's not a via media between Reformed theology and uh, Remonstrant theology, but it's a via media between a certain slice of Reformed theology and Remonstrant theology, where they see themselves as a continuation of another slice of Reformed theology, basically, or at least on the question of the extent of the atonement. So. Right, and that's important to keep in mind because, um, like you mentioned, uh, like because the very concept of the book, right, is that not only is Davenant's position Catholic, it is Reformed. That's important to keep in mind. It's not something that's supposed to, you know, sort of bridge the gap between the Reformed position and the Arminian position. It is right. a Reformed position, right? Yeah. And so could you explain, because... Sometimes you note that sometimes in the older scholarship, uh, we see Davenant kind of lumped in with Amaraldianism, and you see that not just with the older scholarship, but even with many of the laity as well. People kind of just assume whenever they kind of hear of Davenant's view that he's just kind of an Amaraldian, or sometimes, as you said before, uh, anachronistically uh, four pointer. Yeah. Right, so, why? Why is lumping Davenant in with Amaraldianism and four-point uh, Calvinism so inaccurate? Well, uh, yeah, so on the Amaraldian side of things, I think it's important to distinguish the two, not only because there are two streams that seem to kind of independently exist, uh, there's not a lot of overlap. In other words, I am I have no knowledge that like the French school uh, at Samur, the Academy of Samur, and those theologians, whether it be um, Amy Rowe or Laplace or any of these other guys, I have no knowledge that they are even aware of really Davenant or quote English hypothetical universalism. Mm -hmm. um similarly um in england among the english hypothetical universalists james usher and culverwell uh uh not culverwell uh, uh i didn't mean to say him i meant to say preston um mm -hmm. and um and davenant they're saying stuff before any rolianism even exists as a thing in france now cameron is kind of a uh contemporary to some degree but as far as i know there was no reading davenant or uh, uh, usher weren't really reading cameron and like getting their stuff there's like no cross pollination and so um it's just the as a historian they may be coming to similar conclusions, but they're coming to similar, they may be coming to similar conclusions, but from different sources altogether. And so that's really just, um, well, okay, you know. Um, mo moreover, it when you use, when most people use the term Amiroldianism, they don't just simply mean, um, <laughs> 
the view on the extent of the atonement that some of the French Emiraldians were taking, they, they also often import other sorts of positions that either Davenant or Usher may or may not have agreed with or actually disagreed with, right? So there's the mm -hmm. whole, uh, like, uh, d decretal ordering, which I think actually Davenant uh, does seem to teach something like the Amiraldian ordering of the decree. Um, however, again, when he's taking that sort of ordering, that ordering can be found in earlier Reformed theologians, uh, uh, irrespective of Amiro or anyone else that's doing that sort of thing. And so Davenant would, have, would not have seen it to be problematic to take a position on that. Uh, and then... And then we have this curious letter um, where Davin actually, uh, he, he writes, there, there's this letter written to from the French churches. They want the Church of England to give a judgment, actually, to, to kind of um, argue against this kind of uh, French Amiraldianism that seems to have been creeping up in the 30s. It seems like it was written something like in the early 30s. And mm -hmm. 1630s. And Davenant, Davenant's the one who actually writes the response. And uh, it's a, supposedly kind of like a summary of Cameron's teaching. And if you read his response, it's anywhere between there, there, there are there are one or two points where he's like, yeah, if he's saying this, it's absolutely true. And I don't know why anyone would disagree with it. And then there's a number of points where he thinks that Cameron is Cameron via the people that wrote this letter uh, are being, uh, or that Cameron is ambiguous. And then there's some points where he just thinks that at least the language that they're suggesting Cameron uses is just flat out bad uh, language. So we have this little nugget of Davenant actually dealing with what we might call early Amy Roldianism. And he's kind of like some things I like some things. I'm I'm not sure what they're saying, and depending on what they're saying, it could be bad. And then some things he's like, at least linguistically, I don't like this way of speaking. So I make of that as being again, there's some things in French Emiraldianism that I'm pretty confident Davenant just wouldn't have had any time for. And then there are some things in French Emiraldianism that he would have been defensive about. He would have been defensive of their view on the extent of the atonement, it seems to me. Um, but but he would have been very ambivalent on the order of the decree business. And then he would have been hostile to some of the ways that they were talking about universal grace in particular. So, uh, yeah, um, as, for, as far as uh, the L in Tula, I, I, or like him being a four-pointer, I think that that's all rather absurd because he not only helped write the second uh, um, main doctrine at, of the Canons of Dort, um, but, but wholeheartedly agreed with all the language found uh, at Dort on the extent of the atonement. So if that defines, as uh, one recent book uh, put it, um, if that defines what limited atonement is, then actually Davenant agrees with it. So, you know, like that's that's the weirdness about this whole conversation is that we live in isms and we live in like these, you know, kind of like detached um, uh, labels instead of instead of precise dealing very precisely with specific propositions and where people kind of you know, uh, agree or disagree, right? So he agrees mm -hmm. with every article at the Senate of Dort. Yes. The extent of the atonement. I, I, what, 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 you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's important to note. And so, like, with with the entire, like, debate itself over the extents, you, you kind of go through, uh, I believe, from the early church all the way up to God's talk. And you note, know, of course, that for the Church of England, uh, this shouldn't be overestimated, but it also shouldn't be underestimated that the patristics played an important role in the Church of England, right? So they did not want to depart from the fathers. And so 
Uh, how exactly does Davenant describe the view of the fathers on this issue when he talks about it in his De Morte Christi? Yeah, I mean, uh, he just simply thinks that he his position is a regurgitation of, mm -hmm. of Augustinian teaching. By Augustinian, I don't just mean Augustine, I mean Prosper and Fulgentius, two of kind of uh, disciples of Augustine. They're, they're, that's kind of the trinity of um, Augustinian anti-Pelagian theology uh, in the later patristic period, or you might say like the early medieval period. Um, and so he, Prosper of Aquitaine and Fulgentius uh, and uh, Augustine, he thinks are in agreement um, with his position. Um, yeah, I, that, that's just, that's just mm -hmm. the bottom line. Um, uh, interestingly, Owen, uh, who writes a preface or in his preface to the death of Christ, this isn't his death of death, but this is the next book that he wrote uh, responding to Baxter. Mm -hmm. Owen, in that preface, says it, uh, uh, Davenant's book had just came out and he had just gotten a chance to briefly look at it. And he said, I don't, I don't really have a chance to respond to it in, you know, uh, in, uh, you know, any sort of uh, long fashion. But he he uh, he he admit he he says in there. He admits that he that Davenant sounds like Augustine, Prosper, mm -hmm. and Fulgentius. But then and then he goes on, but whether or not he agrees with the apostles or with scripture <laughs> is all, or with reason, you know, yeah. uh, you know, a logic, right, is a different matter, right? So he, Owen's objection is not an objection that Davenant is non Augustinian on this. His objection is he's bad on the Bible and bad in logic. Or something like yes. that, you know. So yes, you know, correct. Logic. Yeah, he refers to those uh, big three and says, "Yeah, that that he that Davenant's position is it is suited to the expressions of sundry learned men, yes, like those." Like but those guys, yeah, yeah, but that whether his position is actually free from opposition to the scripture or indeed self contradiction is not so apparent. Yeah. Right, he'll say. Yeah, uh, so. But was there ever a time where Owen, uh, do you know if there was ever a time where Owen didn't so easily concede him where, where maybe he might have thought that that the Augustinians actually agreed with him, well, as sometimes yeah, people do he, today? He, he, does, he Yeah. So in his previous work, published two years earlier, Owen has an appendix. This is in the Death of Death. It's an appendix where he cites all these guys in support of, uh, as, assuming that they're in support of Owen's position taken in death of death. Two years later, apparently he reads Davenant and decides, well, okay, Davenant might have a point here. Now, of course, this actually gets to something that I've, I've uh, that, that I, I think people overlook too much is that actually many of the things that Owen argues in the death of death, Davenant's actually agreeing with. In other, against the Arminian interlocutor that, that Owen has. In other words, Davenant is agreeing on certain points so that when so that when Owen quotes Prosper or Augustine as sounding Owenian, mm -hmm. Davenant's like, yeah, I agree on those. Like I'm affirming those propositions. We're both in agreement on the things that you're citing. The problem is you're not, you're not buying into some of the other things that they say that are, that are more kind of that that create the other side of Davenant's position, which is yeah. the universal aspect um, or the universal intention. And mm -hmm. so that's really what's going on there is is that um, uh, I, I think that again, uh, there's there's more agreement between like Davenant and Owen than. We often want to give, and then there's radical disagreement among the two on certain points. And so yeah. people don't want to assume, well, they assume the latter, but they don't assume that, but they usually don't grant the former. And that, right. that, 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 that creates more concern because then they, they're, they're like, if they don't grant the former, then how can Owen and Davenant both agree with like 
the second name doctrine at door, right? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. Well, unless you realize what they're actually what they do actually agree on. So, anyway. Yeah, and yeah, and getting into like Augustine's view exactly, um, because that's often brought up. Uh, there are actually some people um, who actually accuse Augustine and the Augustinians of teaching uh, a more. Uh, this this is of course anachronistically speaking, but of teaching a more Owenian view. Uh, so how does Prosper of Aquitaine respond to these charges that Augustine and the Augustinians believe that Christ simpliciter only died for the elect? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, well, this was the charge that the Pelagians or semi-Pelagians were charging Augustine as teaching and Prosper responds, Augustine uh really leaves it to prosper and then augusta dies and so prosper is left to deal with these sorts of things charges but uh Pro prosper denies it uh and he says we've never taught that and then explains what they do and do not believe and um while it would be somewhat anachronistic to appeal to something like the lombardian formula uh at the end of the day you have Prosper making these claims that are very like the Lombardian formula. Christ died for the elect alone in this way. Christ died for all men in this way. And of course, Davenant ste steps back even and he says, listen, um, you, have, you have baptism and original guilt being washed away for both elect and non-elect infants. Right. And he's like, he's like their whole doctrine of baptism has not just the death of Christ being applicable to elect and non-elect in within the church community, of course, the covenant community, or what we would say the covenant community, at least like what Presbyterians would call the covenant community, but also that it's actually applied. The death of Christ is actually applied to, it washes away original guilt at baptism, all original guilt of all children that are baptized, whether elect or non-elect, get their, their so so the reprobate, mm -hmm. reprobate chill, reprobate ch baptized children are only damned on account of actual guilt in their own sin, not from Adamic sin, because that right. was washed away at baptism. And he he's like, he's like, so so regardless regardless of whether or not you think that they have a position of like a universal satisfaction for sins or anything like that, or they're comfortable with saying Christ died for all, although he thinks that they say those sorts of things. And I think he's right. Um, he, mm -hmm. he says their theology is definitely not what we would call Owenian, right? It's right. not limiting the death of Christ to the elect alone. It's just not. And he kind of makes that claim throughout the history of the church. There's been some, disagreement exactly on the extent of the atonement mm -hmm. but it's almost universal that it's not limited to the elect whatever the case is ever yes mm -hmm. within church history so right. that's that's kind of davenant's stick and i i mean he's it, it to my mind on the historical claim he's right mm -hmm. and related to that is also uh the issue of the Lombardian formula, right? Which, like, you note the significance of it, um, both in the 16th century, also in the early 17th century. Uh, but before getting into the details of that, first, what exactly is this uh, Lombardian formula and where does it come from? Yeah. So it's named after Peter of Lombard, who was a, uh, a theologian who had compiled uh kind of uh these um theological questions and answers mm -hmm. the answers are uh, rely heavily on quotations from early church fathers and other earlier theologians especially augustine and in book three i believe it is of lombard's uh sentences is what it's called sententia which is Mm. people's views is what it that's that means views uh viewpoints or something anyways right. um he uh he he 
um, I forget what the question is. It's something about the passion of Christ. And he basically says, Christ is our high priest, um, uh, was yes. uh, mm-hmm. our high priest, um, and that uh, as our high priest, he died uh, uh, for all uh, with regard to the sufficiency of the sacrifice and he died for the elect alone with regard to its efficacy or something like that. Then later theologians, they, they make it a dictum. And the dictum or the saying is Christ died sufficiently for all, or Christ died for all sufficiently, and then Christ died for the elect alone effectually or efficaciously, where you have a claim of... Ha- Christ dying for all, you have a claim that Christ dies for the elect alone, okay? Those are obviously two different senses, and those senses are determined by the adverbs sufficiently Mm -hmm. and effectually. How did he die for all? Well, he died for them all sufficiently, whatever that means. And he died for all, or died for the elect alone. How? Uh, Effectually whatever that means. Right. And they, they even, because people will note the significance of the formula, um, but sometimes they will consciously uh, disagree maybe with the original intention of it, maybe modify what we mean by when we say sufficient. So how, what is this distinction that you make? Uh, I believe Davna makes it as well, but uh, in the book, you make a distinction between uh, a bare sufficiency and an ordained sufficiency and how they're not the same thing. Yeah. Um, so for Davenant, well, with regard to the Lombardian formula, th- throughout the medieval period, it was always said in a certain way. It was mm-hmm. said cr- in the way that I was saying it, where you take um, – you, you, you make the claim is that Christ died for all and Christ died for the elect in these two different ways with these mm-hmm. adverbial modifiers. Then um, people don't like uh, it, it. There are reformed people. Bayes is the first one I know. He may not have been the first, but he's the first one I know. He's also named by later theologians as the first one who started to attack this language. But it, it starts to, uh, the claim shifts to making predication, a claim of predication, not of uh, Christ dying for, but rather the death of Christ is sufficient for all, uh, and the death of Christ is effectual for the elect alone. And uh, Davenant realizes that, and and of course, the people that are modifying this language are also realizing that that's an actual different claim. The um, in the in the original Lombardian formula, the word "for" denoted an intentionality. He hmm. intended to die for all. How to to make a sufficient satisfaction for their sins? And then it says he intended to die for the elect alone in order to purchase the effectuality of their salvation, the effectual application of their um, salvation, right? When you, when you modify it to talk about predication to, to the predicative way of saying it, you're, you're no longer talking about intentions, Christ died for, but now you're just simply talking about the death of Christ itself. It is this. Yeah. It is valuable. You're now just talking about its value. You're not right. talking anything about God's intentionality or his will with regard to it. You're simply talking about value. Uh, and, and, and so so the mere sufficiency position is a claim about the value of uh, the infinite value of the blood of God, as Acts twenty twenty eight, I believe it's Acts twenty twenty eight, says uh, that it's uh, the blood of God shed. Um, right, we're saying that it's of infinite value. 
Whereas the original Lombardian way, a formula way of talking about this was claiming that God willed the death of Christ for all in a certain way. And God willed the death of Christ for the elect alone in a certain way. And it's those intent, two intentionalities that Davenant wants to defend. And that's where you get a, quote, ordained sufficiency. It's a willed sufficiency. He willed, uh, he willed the death of Christ for all. He willed the death of Christ for the elect alone in a certain way. And so that's kind of what it is. I mean, I could, I could go on and talk about like um, ways of explain, like analogies of explaining the two things and why they're important. I don't know if you want me to get into that, but anyways, I could yeah, that that. That makes sense. Um, yeah, because because sometimes I think people sort of when they first come across the view, uh, they're not really familiar with the differences because they they kind of just hear sufficient and they assume the mere sufficiency and they'll say, well, you know, of course, uh, every we can all affirm that uh, what's so controversial about that. But there's actually the intentionality aspect of it that kind of is really what makes the difference. And, you know, related to that, you you also note how, uh, you know, people will often assume that sort of these controversies might have arose uh, in the context of the controversy with the remonstrance. Um, but you actually talk about how they they arose before that. Right. They arose uh, in a, a disagreement between the reformed and the Lutherans. So could you talk about that? situation which occurs before the remonstrant controversy yeah i mean the lutherans um sounded at least like they were teaching that christ died for all such that all people have been placed in a state of grace by birth and that one's unbelief is the cause for why some people are damned not because they have been remitted of their sins at least initially so so when you read andrei jacob andrei um at the colloquy of montmeliard uh this is a colloquy that he has with beza that the German uh, uh, magistrates set up to try to get agreement among the Lutherans and reformed in Germany to kind of find agreement. Um, yeah, he, he will talk like, uh, well, so uh, Andrei affirms these sorts of propositions. He affirms that children that die in infancy of pagans will be saved why because christ died for them okay right mm -hmm. um and then he'll talk about the reason that people are damned aren't because christ didn't die for their sins and they haven't been remitted of them it's that they haven't embraced the gospel is why they're damned they're damned on account of that sin in particular and the reason that it seems like he's saying this is because he has this position that when Christ died, the covenant of grace, to use our lingo, was so universal that everyone was brought into it. And unbelief, when you grow up, your unbelief excludes you from that covenant at some point. You're in the covenant until you exclude yourself from it. And this position, the reformed hate, right? By the way, this 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 whole universal right. covenant of grace business and stuff uh, yeah. uh, is also disliked in uh, by certain. Uh, it seems to be taught by certain kind of fringe reformed theologians, uh, like 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 Baxter. I I wouldn't want to call him French, but like Baxter argues something like this. Um, and so does, um, uh, so do the Amiraldians. It seems like they have something going on like this as well. Either way, um, the reformed, at least in the late 16th century, 
they find this absolutely objectionable. And so that's what gets Beza to say the sorts of things that he does on the extended atonement um, and really start denying claims that er in earlier Reformed theology were not controversial, like Christ died for all sufficiently. Right. Yes, uh, that's good to keep in mind. Now, uh, regarding the actual Synod of Dort, because you made some comments about uh, about Stavnin's, uh participation at the Synod, I was interested uh, to find, I believe you said that the British delegation was the most important delegation uh, at the Synod. Uh, so could you explain maybe why uh, you would say that the British delegation was so significant? Well, they are certainly the most significant foreign delegation. And the reason that they're the most significant foreign delegation is because King James is paying, mm. at least partially, for this whole affair. And the Dutch simply can't get this done without the British signing off on it. So if the, and then the British are told by King James, you are not to sign off on anything that is in any way contradictory to the 39 articles. And so the Dutch may have wanted a more Owenian kind of position in, indeed, it almost seems certain that they did. And mm -hmm. the British delegation at every point make sure that they can sign off on what ends up being uh, taught there in the second main doctrine. And I, I, I go through the literally manuscripts of these drafts uh, where the British delegation is like annotating changes that they want made to these uh, drafts of the canons to make sure that their own position can get in there. And then I also note that Davenant seems to have authored, uh, well, the British delegation, but it's very likely to me that it's Davenant himself authors two, five, and at least part of another one. Anyways, so he actually like wrote it. So, so the British delegation offers them to uh, offer some theses to add, and they and they end up adding some of these theses. So, right, and I I found that interesting because there there seems to be the modern consensus that uh, the evidence position is within confessional orthodoxy, but sometimes people who are opposed to Davenant's view, not just its correctness, but it's even being reformed, they will say that things like that the Synod didn't explicitly condemn it, it might have been implicitly condemned, or that's they didn't have it in mind. But uh, I found that chapter interesting because, like you said, you go through not just the fact that it is confessional, but the process whereby we can see that the language is changed at times, uh, such that the evidence in the hypothetical universalist can be within those confessional boundaries. They can adhere to all of the canons, right? So that uh, was really significant because it's it goes to show that they, they did have it in mind. Uh, they did have Davenant's view in mind, and they did make it so that he could sign off on it. Um, but getting into, like, because there, there are many common objections Right nowadays, uh, but one of the common objections, of course, is that Davenant's position, in light of his being reformed, uh, you know, because he believes in unconditional election and other things, that it somehow causes this confusion in the Trinity, where God wills one thing that is contradictory to what He wills elsewhere. So, how does how does a uh, Davenant respond to these? kinds of criticisms with his articulation of the will of God and distinctions that he makes therein. Yeah, I mean, he likes to appeal. He really leans on um, some of the Dominican theologians in his day, uh, Banyas being uh, one of the main guys, in fact. Um, uh, is it Domingo Banyas? Um, mm -hmm. I think is uh, the first name there. Yeah, um, he uh, he makes all the sorts of distinctions that one would expect. He talks about 
God's hidden and revealed will. He talks about his will of sign and his uh, will of good pleasure um, or his signified will and his will of good pleasure. And the bottom line for Davenant is whatever God simply wills or uh, whatever God wills according to his good pleasure takes place. God does not will the absolute salvation of anyone but the elect. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and when he wills the salvation of the non-elect, he wills it conditionally. He wills it insofar as a, uh, a, um, in the same way that, uh, that God willed that if Judas had repented, he would have been saved. This is a will that David or that God has, he thinks. God yeah. has wills so that we can say to Judas, if you repent, God wills to save you, right? God wills to save you on the condition that you repent. Um, right. If you repent, God will save you. And that 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 is a will that he has. And so he distinguishes between conditional and non-conditional willing and these sorts of things. Um some of the distinctions he makes, uh, reformed people are going to have no problem with it. And then others like Turton aren't going to, they're not going right. to like some of the distinctions that he makes, but they would have to have, they would have to have the same problems with some of the Dominicans, right? So in this case, Davin is a little bit perhaps too domestic, uh, for, for, uh, you know, the reason why Turretin and some of the later guys don't like some of these distinctions is really not so much for why some of these reformed are using them, although they don't like that and they do note this. Mm-hmm. But it's really because of how the Arminians were reinterpreting some of these distinctions. And so there's some of that in play, too. But at the end of the day, uh, Davidin doesn't really care. Um, and he's he's very defensive and he just cites folk for these various distinctions and applies them as much as he thinks is necessary. I mean, at the bottom, the bottom end, the bottom of the, de- at, 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 at bottom though, for Davenant, God always gets what he wants. Right. He, he never is thwarted. Right. If he wanted to save the non-elect, if he wanted to actually save them, simply said, absolutely said, he would have given them divine grace and they would have believed, uh, like saving divine grace, and they would have believed, right? So whatever, uh, so for Davenant, it, 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 it ipso facto follows that the type of willing that he has for the salvation of the non-elect is not the same type of willing that he has for the elect. That just follows. Right, right. And I believe the the willing that he has for, uh, in Davenant's view, that the willing that God has for saving the non-elect uh, would be uh, the will of simple complacency. It's something like that, that God wills the good. It is good for men to be saved, uh, you know, including the non-elect. So in that sense, he wills it. But of course, in his uh, will of good pleasure, that would not be the case. And that's why it doesn't actually come to pass. And And so, yeah, that's definitely one of the more common objections, of course, that I see. Now, another common objection, of course, is going to be the double payment argument. You know, uh, how can God condemn uh, the non-elect if Christ already paid for their sins, especially uh, in light of uh, a penal substitutionary understanding of the atonements? Uh, you know, isn't that unjust, right? It's paying the same sins twice. Uh, so how is that engaged with also? Yeah. Uh, so for Davenant, he says, if it were the case that you yourself paid for that sin twice, that would totally follow. But he says, as soon as there's a mediator or a third party that's brought into this, then conditions can be attached such that, uh, the penalty can be paid by the third party, but the benefit can, can be conditioned on something bu- with regard to the other party, such that the the the, the third party can uh, the the fir- the first and third party we might say 
can decide that the second party doesn't get the benefit unless X, Y, or Z happen, right? And so at the end of the day, um, th uh, there's there's no injustice uh, wherein a third party chooses to take on the penalty for the second party's sin, but says that the the benefit does not accrue to the second party unless the second party does something like exercise faith and repentance or something like that, right? And then uh, there, there's other objections beyond that that later theologians make, although he doesn't make, uh, as far as I remember, he doesn't make such an objection, which uh, is the Dabney objection, of course. Dabney's objection to the double payment argument is, is that um, – Unless you unless you have an eternal justification or a justification at the cross, you still have uh, us under God's wrath, and and uh, uh, being an enmity, enmity with God until we believe. Yet, if we're elect, Christ has paid the payment for that. So, why are we still at enmity with God? Isn't that isn't that one of the things that God has? dealt with or satisfied for right and so right. that Dabney just rejects it on the basis of you either have to hold to a sort of eternal or justification at the cross uh position which he thinks is just wrong or else mm -hmm. double payment doesn't even work like theologically it just doesn't work um there are other uh some later guys take davenant's objection and they run with it even more so uh a pole hill is it Edward Pole Hill? Oh, yeah, I believe it's Edward Pole Hill in his um, uh, book on the divine will. He has a whole list of responses to the so-called double payment argument. And I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a well-known argument. Interestingly enough, um, Ursinus brings the, the interlocutor that mm -hmm. Ursinus um, uses in his... Uh, um, in his commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism, uses the double payment argument against uh, uh, Ursinus's claim for a universal satisfaction for sins, and he doesn't deny right. universal satisfaction for sins. He just says you don't get you don't get the benefit unless you repent and believe, and that's it. Right. Yeah, and there are a lot of well, I wouldn't say a lot, but there there are multiple things that are sort of correlated to one's view on the extent of the atonements, like if I recall correctly, I think that's Richard Baxter. I don't know if he has any other basis for this other than knowing Owen's view, but it seems like he just kind of assumes that Owen holds to eternal justification. And Owen says that, you know, there are very learned men who do and have held to that position, but that he, he, that Owen never has and still does not. Um, but people see a, a connection between the two. So there's a connection between that, but there, there's also a connection between one's view on the extent of Christ's satisfaction and then your view on the gospel offer. So how did those two uh, relate to each other? Uh, extent and then gospel offer in particular? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. So for, for Davenant, it works something like this. The logic is something like this. And I've tried to um I, I i tried at one point i think in my dissertation to or in my book bring this out a little bit but the argument is something like this at least with regard to a universal satisfaction the necessity of a universal satisfaction we say on what grounds is god able to forgive us in accordance with his justice well we say the grounds that he's able to forgive any one of their sins is the death of Christ. And then you want to say something like, can you tell any person, and I'll avoid the Christ died for you business, and instead say, can you tell any person that God is able to forgive them of their sin? Now, it seems to me that most Reformed people would want to say yes to that. Mm -hmm. Then Davenant would press them, on what grounds can you claim that God is able to forgive them of their sins if he never did anything according to God's justice that would allow him to forgive them of their sins. In other words, without a 
without a without a mediator on their behalf without a satisfaction on their behalf god's not even able to forgive people of their sins in the same this is precisely why were we to meet a fallen angel apart from the fact that we have no revelation that we are to give the gospel to the angels david it says the reason that you couldn't offer the gospel to the angels is precisely because he didn't die for them there's there's no satisfaction made for angelic sin but right. this is precisely why we can say that to all human beings because there is satisfaction made for all human beings sin according to his position and so that's how he ties that in that that to my, that that argument right there to me is the quintessential davenantian argument for why he holds to hypothetical whatever his hypothetical universalist position is because he doesn't think you can have a true genuine free offer to everyone without that now of course there are theologians that try to hold the two together with a limited atonement david thinks it's absurd logic he's a, he i mean he he would make the same claim about owens you know like the whole like self-contradiction business he would just yeah. say owen is self-contradictory on that point and well they were both brilliant folks so yeah but one of them is probably right and one of them is probably wrong or i suppose both of them could be wrong but anyway right and uh yeah there are people who try to hold the two some people you know i know people uh today and, and as well of course there's been people in history that kind of just bite the bullet and say that they don't believe in a gospel offer uh so you, so you do have some of those i i believe it's I a command it. not an offer you're right. not saying that god can forgive you of your sin you're just telling it's a bare command of repent and believe yeah i've seen it amongst certain strands of particular baptists um i know john gill affirms eternal justification i don't know if john gill denies the gospel offer but uh, people who who love him definitely seem to deny it. Um, but yeah, some people are, are okay with just kind of the, biting the, the leader, bullet. John Gerstner, uh, does John Gerstner. explicitly yeah. so. He goes yeah. after he goes after all of Westminster on this point. Yeah, yeah, yes. He throws them all under the bus. <laughs> yeah, and that's always been interesting to me. There, there was a time where, of course, I was a uh, a little more comfortable denying the gospel offer, but that's. A whole another pass uh but nonetheless yeah these are related issues i mentioned to you know friends of mine in the past that you kind of have to have these things in mind uh because you know of course this is more so for the historical aspect of these things but of course at some point uh we kind of have to take the historian's hat off and commit to certain positions i am still you know flirting around with it um but I will say that it is uh, very appealing. Um, I have told people that I'm, I've grown to become a little uncomfortable with the modification or sometimes just outright denial of the Lombardian formula as uh, useless, like uh, Beza does. Um, so, I mean, there's certain things like that. But nonetheless, yeah, other than that, uh, is there anything else uh, that we can – expect from you articles chapters books anything uh that comes to mind so right now i'm finishing up a project of uh of revising the 19th century translation of davenant uh davenant's book that we've been talking about basically the whole time where he lays out his whole position um and that'll be published with the davenant press uh with the davenant institute uh, hopefully within the year so mm -hmm. You would think that that would be one of the first things they do. Uh, interesting. Well, uh, yeah, and uh, I've also suggested that uh, they eventually try to get everything published that Davenant wrote um, in a works, the works of John Davenant. I think that'd be totally sweet and quite apropos for, well, the Davenant Institute. Right, right. I, I agree. I have read his, um, I've read one of the volumes that he has on justification, but just like on Google books, it would be nice to have more of his stuff. I'm not too familiar with what else. I know he has a Colossians commentary, which uh, Banner of Truth did. Uh, 
Yes. I believe. Uh, well, and they're just they're just reprinting like the facsimile from yeah. the, the 19th century. It's it's basically it's just the 19th century version, right? And so that's without any footnotes, a scholarly apparatus of any kind. I'm I'm adding all that stuff, all the citations, tracking mm -hmm. that down. Yeah. Nice. Well, yeah. Well, uh, we'll be on the lookout for that. And I believe uh, there's also um, an upcoming class also with the Davenant Institute on uh, free choice in yep. early modern reform theology. Could you talk yep. about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, this is uh, the first Davenant class that I'll be teaching a second time. First time around uh, was a was a, a success. I, I enjoyed teaching it. Um, so I'll be teaching another round of it, although I won't be doing all the same readings that we read the first time around. And we'll be looking at the kind of naughty K-N-O-T-T-Y question uh, related to free choice among the reformed and some of the diversity going on there, some of the questions that are being asked, many of the distinctions. I'll try to at some point relate it to the modern kind of debate between Helm and Muller and some of these other folk on compatibilism and libertarianism. Uh, although that's not the main aim of the, uh, of the, of the course, we, we will have at least some recourse to that conversation as well. Yeah, that's good to know. That's definitely a interesting subject that like the Davenant's hypothetical universalism is itself overly simplified so much so that you kind of see just people sometimes outright, you know, professing Calvinists themselves just just bite the bullet and say free will doesn't exist. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a, it's an insane thing because there's literally no, uh, there's really no reform theologian who just simply says such a thing ever, mm -hmm. ever. And most of them say the exact opposite ex explicitly, right? And so that's that's weird, right? So, right. yeah, I mean, you have Luther kind of denying free choice, right? And people like think, okay, so whatever Luther's doing must, the reform must also agree with his lingo. But in fact, we find out that none of that, well, that substantially there might be some agreement, substantially, but linguistically there's like major disagreement um, on the linguistic, on the word level. So, yeah. Yes, yes, so much so. I believe it's Turretin who says that we, we uphold free choice far more than our opponents, right? It's not something that's just like uh, rejected as uh, this yeah, yeah. bad thing, you know? I, that's that's the Jesuits and the Arminians. Right, the Jesuits yeah, and the Arminians yeah. who believe in free will and not yeah. us. So yeah, people should be on the lookout for that. I'm considering uh, joining a class as well. I think it would be nice. I already have some of the works that I imagine uh, would be utilized. Yeah. So. Yeah, everyone should uh, be on the lookout for that because it's a great subject. Um, yeah. And other than that, uh, that should be it, unless you have any other comments. Um, and yeah, uh, but thanks for joining. Um, like you. I mentioned, it's great. It's great to sort of meet you. I told you uh, uh, I'll, I'll be letting Pastor Gleason that I got to talk yeah, give to him you. My, give him my greetings. Uh um, we've had contact over the years, even after seminary. And so, um, yeah, I'm very appreciative of what he's doing and, uh, um, his, his huge family. So, uh, it is huge. Yeah, it he is. Has a huge family. So anyways, give his, uh, 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 my greetings to them, them all. I certainly will. And yeah, thanks again. Um, hopefully, uh, in the future, depending on what other projects you might have, in the years to come, could have you on again. Cool. All right. Thank you, Edwin. Yes. Thank you. Oh.